Good morning, everybody. It's nine o'clock GMT plus eight here in Perth. I am very grateful that you are here with an early start. Please allow me to introduce myself, introduce the team, introduce the event, and we can kick off for today. Hi, everyone. I am Professor Crystal Everdon. I'm the founder of the TikTok Cultures Research Network, and it's our great pleasure to have you here for our seventh event. That's really, really quick since our first one was launched not too long ago. We welcome you to TikTok and Children. It's very exciting because it's our first partnership co-hosted with the ARC Center of Excellence for the Digital Child. Our co-organizers are myself, founder of TCRN, as well as associate investigator of the center. We have Dr. Jin Lee, who's one of the founding members of TCRN, as well as a research fellow at the center, and Professor Tama Lieber, who is chief investigator at the center. A few housekeeping issues before we properly welcome you. Presentations are being recorded, and as usual, with all TCRN events, they'll be archived on our website. But be assured that the Q&A and chat box function will be kept entirely private and offline. If you're joining us as a panelist, we send you a gentle reminder to please mute your mics and videos until it's your session slot. And if you're an attendee, you're welcome to use the Q&A function at any time. Right at the bottom, you see our hashtag TikTok colleges. Now, if you're following along on Twitter today, our very trusty web developer and social media RA will be live tweeting the event, including some links that our presenters have prepared for you ahead of time. Without further ado, please allow me to properly welcome you. So here at Curtin University, we are based on the Wajak Nyunga grounds of the traditional custodians of our land. And before we begin, it's customary for us to issue a formal welcome to country. Please allow me now to welcome Emeritus Professor Simon Forrest, who will be doing that special welcome for us. Hi, Hi Wandu. Hello and welcome. My name is Simon Forrest Burungu. I'm a Wajak Baladong Noongar with King Connections to Yamaji and Wongai peoples. I am of this land and place. I follow a bloodline of people who have walked and cared for this land for over 40,000 years. This is a welcome to country. A welcome to Wajak Noongar Buja. A welcome to country recognises and acknowledges us and the first and continuing custodians of this land, Australia. Nidjabolo. Thank you to Emeritus Professor Simon Forrest for that welcome. Now it's also customary for us to begin with thanks, although that's usually relegated at the end of the conference when we're fatigued and tired. We are very grateful for the support of various institutes, centers, and people who have allowed this event to happen. So alongside TCRN and the center, we'd like to acknowledge the Social Media Pop Cultures program hosted at the Center for Culture and Technology here at Curtin University. Ms. Linda Durek is one of our very trusty staff members assisting us on the administrative end. Now, TCRN was also supported very generously with funding from the Faculty of Humanities at Curtin, which allows us to operate quite independently as a research group, even as we work closely with platforms. And last but not least, 
All the beautiful graphics you see today were put together by our lab RA, Ms. Adine Kayla. So thank you also to her. If you're joining us for the first time and like to find out more about TCRN as well as the center, those six links at the bottom are some things you could pursue. We'll be showing them in and out throughout the day. So no worries if you haven't got a minute to take them down yet. Final, final bit of announcement before we transit. You know, here at TCRN, we try our best to make sure that all of these events have live after the actual Zoom. And in one of our past events, we focus specifically on TikTok and social movements. We're very glad to share that a collection of papers curated from that session have been officially published in the peer-reviewed top-ranked media studies journal, Social Media Plus Society. Now, collectively, we've got three types of papers in this collection. We open with our editorial from our co-hosts, Dr. Jin Lee and myself. We continue with a group of five peer-reviewed papers that look at in-depth case studies on how social movements are conceptualized, enacted, or even challenged and resisted in relation to the features, functions, and practices on TikTok. We've also got a really, really great teaser from three emerging early career research pieces, where they focus specifically on methodological approaches to studying social movements online. If you'd like to check out more of these works and our pieces, please go along to Twitter, TikTok Cultures, or the hashtag TikTok Cultures, and these pieces will be live tweeted today. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce our first session. Now, some background, because everyone loves a behind the scenes story. When TCRN was first launched in 2020, we were very fortunate to already be having lots of conversation with Byte Jans as we were growing in order for us to make sure that our research while contributing to scholarship was also directly being able to be fed back into some platform policy decision-making as well as some of the outreach they were doing for their users. And so over the years, we've been very fortunate to partner with four of their different country offices on various initiatives. But it's today in our seventh event that we have at the honor of two of their representatives from ByteDance join us today. We have Claire Gartland from the Trust and Safety Global Product Policy Department, as well as Kathleen Grant, who I've had the pleasure of speaking to several consecutive years from TikTok's Trust and Safety team. So may I please invite Claire and Catherine to join us on camera so that we can commence our fireside conversation. Thank you. So all the magic you see happening is thanks to a very trusty RA, Naomi Robinson. So thanks, Naomi, also for being our visit in the screen. Welcome, Catherine and Claire. It's really good to see you again. Every time we chat, it is always a bit of an acrobatic exercise with time zones. So I do appreciate your flexibility. Um, perhaps for those of us who are not familiar with what it's like to work in industry, would you like to tell us a bit about your portfolio, who you are, and what you do with ByteJans and TikTok? So over to you. Great. Well, first, let me say thank you so much for having us uh, join today's session. Really looking forward to hearing more of the presentations and, of course, to speaking with you, Crystal. Um, so my name is Claire Gartland. Um, as you mentioned, I lead our global youth safety and well-being team uh, within TikTok's trust and safety product policy department. Uh, my background is um, in uh, sort of legal studies. I'm a lawyer by training, but I've wor been working on child safety and privacy issues uh, for many years now. Previously, I was with Meta and have been at TikTok for about a year. Um, so I mentioned that I lead our youth safety and well-being team. This team is staffed with global experts in adolescent development, education, children's rights, who really consider how youth may be unique, uniquely affected by content, interactions, and platform design features in ways that are really developmentally different uh, from experiences for adults. Our team's North Star is to mitigate psychological and physical risks and promote healthy expression identity development, really working to ensure that all of our product policies are adapted to young people's best interests, unique developmental life stages, as well as globally diverse experiences. 
And we'll talk about this a little bit more um, shortly, but we're structured within the product policy department as what we call a policy horizontal, which means we're organized to collaborate broadly across all product policy categories, such as exploitation and abuse, harassment and bullying, violent extremism, misinformation, to really ensure that that subject matter expertise is embedded into all aspects of the policies that we developed. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Claire. Um, and yeah, the first thing I want to do really is echo what Claire said about being really appreciative about being included in this event. Um, we're really, you know, impressed by all the work that the TikTok Cultures Research Network does um, and excited to continue our collaboration. Um, so as you can see, um, my title is uh, Outreach and Partnerships Manager on the TikTok Global Trust and Safety Team. Um, that team is one with a pretty broad remit, um, but essentially it boils down to making sure that we hear from uh, many perspectives and different types of expertise um, as we work uh, on our trust and safety approach. So building policies, considering changes to our features, um, the kind of whole package of, of how we envision making the platform a safe place to be online. Um, Concretely, uh, we tend to break down our portfolios on this team into topical, regional, or program roles. Um, so that means that we have folks on our team who focus on a specific issue in terms of building partnerships in that space, or a specific region, um, or, or even a specific market um, in, in terms of places that we really need to uh, su support the community um, on, on our platform. Um, my role is a global program role, so um, I lead research partnerships, and that's something that we think about as a, um, <clears throat> as a whole um, global effort. Um, when we talk about bringing in an external expertise into the company, there's many different ways that we do that. Um, principally, I would say that involves consultations, um, which, uh, you know, we, we try to bring in um, academic experts many times, but also folks with lived experience um, dealing with some of the issues that manifest online. Um, we also have content and safety advisory councils um, across the different regions that we operate in. Um, and I will say there's at least one uh, youth safety and well-being expert on each of those. Um, what they tend to help us do is really localize our approach, which is very important to how we think about safety on the platform. Um, we also run the uh, transparency and accountability centers. So those are physical spaces uh, where people can come um, and learn about uh, how the platform operates, what the opportunities are uh, on TikTok. Um, how our content moderation works, um, how our recommendation system works. Um, so of course, we announced those sort of right before the pandemic uh, hit. Um, and so it's been a little while coming, but right now we have sites in Los Angeles and Dublin that are open for visitors. Um, and we will have one in Singapore um, in, in, you know, uh, date TBD, but we're excited to get that off the ground as well. Um, and I can drop a link in the chat that talks about that a little bit. Um, for me personally, my priorities as the lead for research partnerships um, are uh, sort of, um, sorry, did I? We're all good. Oh, sorry, it just the screen changed, sorry. Um, I thought I lost you. Um, so a couple of uh, sort of youth safety related things that I'll mention as part of my portfolio. Um, so we have a couple of partnerships that I think are worth highlighting. Um, one is with the Tech Coalition, which for those who aren't familiar, is um, an industry group that brings different companies together to uh, fight against um, online uh, child sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, so that's been a really meaningful place uh, to have a role. I, um, I co-chair the research working group there. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to bring in experts to talk to, to different companies at once. Um, it also has been a path to providing funding for some really important research projects um, through the uh, Tech Coalition Safe Online Fund. Um, 
And then the other partner that I'll, I'll mention or partnership that I'll mention is with the Digital Wellness Lab. Uh, that's based at, out of Boston Children's Hospital. Um, they tend to focus on issues like um, problematic interactive media use, so like screen time, um, and they look at different types of online platforms, so like entertainment platforms, social media, gaming, um, and just sort of how young people are spending their time online and if it's quality time or, or a lot of quantity of time. Um, and they've been really helpful advisors to, to us as we continue to, to think about some of the, um, the tools and um, uh, features that I think Claire will probably speak to more in a little bit. Um, I've also been spending a lot of time thinking about um, or supporting our work to develop and deploy a research API um, and internal processes to make sure that we're um, have a have a really defensible approach to the research that we take on, um, either internally or with partners. So I will leave it there, but really excited to have the have this conversation. Thanks, Catherine and Claire. You do not have easy jobs. Let me just begin with that. It's a very big portfolio you have. And I think a lot of what you do also is sort of like a moving target. I know from just the research that we do, the overview that you've presented is exactly the kind of information we as researchers are always looking for. And speaking from experience, when TCRN was first launched, I remember having to face journalists who kept asking us, why are people interested in a kids app? Why are children on this? And then the discourse changed to why are teens on this? Where are young people doing activist work? But today, I think it'll be quite tricky for anyone to claim that TikTok is still just a space for children or for kids. So we have seen on the research side sort of that evolution in the demographic. We've also always battled tensions with, you know, moral panics over needing to save the children all the way to the other end of the spectrum where we talk about agency rights the ability to have digital literacy skills. So that's what it looks like to us. For you guys on the inside, how do you feel that your management of policy or the overview dealing with children and minors may have evolved over time? Yeah, I think that that's a that's a great question. I think that's true um, for both the sort of the policy development um, as well as research. Um, so youth safety considerations, have really always been at the heart of our trust and safety approach. Um, but of course, as the platform and demographics has evolved, um, you know, we're really continuing to think about the ways in which young people may be impacted by experiences, by content they view, content they create on the platform, really baking that in from the start. Um, so rather, add, rather than adding those considerations um, you know, in at the end, all of our teams sort of start from a place of how are the most vulnerable users impacted by the decisions we're making, whether it's a new policy that we're introducing, the way that we handle accounts when they violated policies, as well as how the product itself is defined, uh, is, is designed. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're structured as a policy, quote unquote, horizontal team. We work quite closely with vertical teams. They're focused on things like exploitation and abuse, harassment and bullying, sexually suggestive content, mental health. All of these teams really take a developmental approach from the start while thinking about how we can sort of scale those protections to really, again, protect our most vulnerable users while also balancing expression and privacy and sort of empowerment considerations for older users as well. Um, we also have a dedicated product team within, within the trust and safety org that's focused on minor safety across all aspects of the platform, whether it's the For You feed, live, direct messaging, comments, you name it. Um, and they're really focused on ensuring that we're sort of enforcing these policies at a global scale, implementing proactive strategies to detect and prevent things like child sexplo sexual exploitation and abuse, as well as really leaning into promoting youth-centered product design. And you can see that in different things like default settings, so higher privacy default settings that are really focused on youth safety by design, as well as some well-being tools that I'll talk about a little bit later on um, as in terms of some updates we've made to screen time management, to family pairing, 
Um, but again, we really think about this not just as sort of protecting young people from potential risks, but also empowering them to build digital literacy, to build resiliency skills, to help you know, self-manage um, their experiences online, while of course having uh, back-end protections to make sure that, you know, really bad actors aren't interacting with young people, that's of course, you know, violative content is removed. Um, and this approach is really reflected in our recently updated community guidelines. You may have seen that these went into effect uh, last month on April 21st. As, as you know, these guidelines establish a code of conduct for using the platform, and they're in, informed by international legal frameworks, industry best practices, input from our community, safety and public health experts, and of course, as, as Catherine noted, our regional safety advisory councils as well. As part of the recent updates that came into effect last month, we introduced a new section dedicated to youth safety and well-being, which I think really reflects this sort of across the board horizontal approach that we take to considering young people's best interests across all of the policies and, and sort of product interventions we have in place. Um, that section details things like our minimum age requirements, as most folks know, you need to be 13 or older to have an account, um, as well as youth-specific content policies, which includes things like child sexual abuse material, youth physical abuse, bullying, dangerous activities and challenges, exposure to overtly mature themes, and more. Um, and really a major part of what we include as well in this update is efforts we take to ensure young people receive developmentally optimal experiences on TikTok, while also allowing them choice to make, to create the experiences that are right for them based on their own developmental stage. So this includes upstream risk prevention strategies, such as limiting access to certain product features. As you might know, um, you can't use direct messaging unless you're 16 or older on the app. You can't go live unless you're 18 or older. Uh, we've also developed content levels that sort content by levels of thematic comfort. And I think this is an area where you see we're really baking in youth safety from the start, while also allowing for content that might be appealing to older audiences um, to, be, to be shown in the For You feed um, when that's appropriate based on the age of that account holder. We also have more restrictive default privacy settings, and we make content created by someone under the age of 16 ineligible for the For You feed, while again also allowing you know, older teens and adults to really have that full experience, again, sort of scaling that based on the maturity levels and comfort levels of, of, our, of, our, of our user population. And Catherine, let me turn it over to you to speak a little bit about this from a research perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Claire, I think you've covered quite a bit of, of how our approach has evolved here at TikTok. Um, but I do think it's worth chiming in um, from the research perspective. You know, we really um, mirror what Claire described about building in considerations around the impact on youth. Um, when you think about, you know, research design and the priorities that we set um, for our, our, our own research agenda and uh, what we can accomplish with partners. Um, so as I mentioned briefly uh, in my introduction, one of my core responsibilities is to focus on building the right internal processes that support research here at TikTok. Um, so what that means in terms of youth safety and well-being is as we grow and sort of build our um, research function, we know that we also have to think about protecting young people who might be subjects of research. Um, so if, you know, children who are using our platform under 18, um, you know, we need to think very carefully about like how we use their data, um, if we interact with them um, more directly to conduct research, you know, having all the right protections in place that I'm sure this audience is very um, familiar with. Um, so I think, you know, it's been a really deliberate and thoughtful effort to ensure that we have the right resources resources and um, guidance in place um, before undertaking research and you know before we sort of leapt into the world of research partnerships um, more fully. Um, you know we're thinking about um, you know making sure that our work adheres to, to the best um, practices in ethical research, um, responsible data handling, um, and then also the best way to sort of um, articulate those expectations to potential partners. Um, and then I think, 
the other thing that's on my mind that sort of fits in this section is, you know, thinking about how we prioritize what research we take on. Um, I think the safety of young people online is always going to be really high on the list of our priorities, um, just given, you know, the the sort of higher responsibility we feel to young people using our platform um, and also the the demographic of people who use who use TikTok who um, tend to be younger though we do uh, see sort of a broadening of, of that as we as we grow and, and reach new communities um, but I will say you know as we prioritize that it's always going to be sort of a balance between staying nimble and responsive to sort of new trends and, and issues as they come up um, but also remaining focused on long-term priorities. So there's, of course, um, sort of high harm potential areas that we have to continually think about and improve. Um, and then just also persistent challenges that are, are really um, tough for the industry to, to handle. And so we need to like um, continuously um, evaluate the space and, and see if things are changing um, and how we can adapt uh, to be supportive of the young people who use TikTok. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there, but we do try to sort of uh, keep evolving um, as we see the challenges evolve, for sure. Thanks, Catherine and Claire. I'm at TCRN. We're primarily a group of qualitative social scientists. I am personally an anthropologist by training. So there is something that each of you said that really tickles my heart and makes me very happy. Earlier on, Catherine, you did mention that your team works specifically on topical, regional, or program-specific verticals where this allows you to focus on an issue or a market. And I love that idea of segmentation because you're not treating all your users as a monolith. In a similar vein, Claire, you talked about how your team tries to work on developmentally optimal experiences that tailor makes based on the user's agency and their changing ability. And I really enjoy that because it doesn't flatten. All under 18s is the same lot of users who don't have the agency to exercise. I know from our backend conversations that you're working on many exciting projects. And I wonder if in relation to these two points, you can tell us a bit about what's coming up on the horizon for your, your teams. So as you know, for the rest of today in the five sessions we'll have from our panelists, we're going to be focused on five themes. They are care, parenting, concerns, play, and regulation. So is there any one of these themes you might want to respond to so you can give us a bit of a teaser on what's coming up with your departments? Yeah, so I'll kick us off and focus on, I think, the first two themes that you mentioned, which is around care, or sort of well-being, and then parenting. Um, so on the care on the care front, I think folks may have seen that we've recently made some updates um, to screen time management for teens on TikTok, um, which are designed uh, for every uh, every account belonging to a user below the age of eighteen to be set to a 60 minute daily screen time limit. Um, and we recognize that, you know, as you noted, uh, all teens are not a monolith. We need to ensure that we're empowering young people um, to use the app um, in a way that's most developmentally optimal based on their age bands or sort of age ranges. We also recognize that age is often an imperfect indicator of maturity levels. But in order to build sort of globally scalable protections, we try to offer what we think of as sort of healthy use nudges towards healthy usage without being overly prescriptive or overly paternalistic and really looking at those as, as an age range based approach for so for our recent screen time management updates um you know we we also recognize there's no collectively endorsed position on sort of the quote unquote right amount of screen time or even the impact of screen time more broadly but we did consult sort of current global academic research as well as experts from the digital Wellness Lab, which Crystal mentioned earlier, is one of our partners that we work with on a range of youth safety and well-being updates um, to help us choose this limit, which applies to all, all teens, but they're able to sort of override it if they'd like um, by entering an additional passcode. Um, research also shows that 
being more aware of how we spend our time can help us be more intentional about the decisions we make. So with that in mind, we're also prompting teens to set a daily screen time limit if they opt out of that 60 minute default and spend more than 100 minutes on, on TikTok in a day. And this really builds on previous efforts um, we've rolled out to encourage teens to enable screen time management. We found that those sort of healthy use nudges um, have actually increased the use of our screen time tools by 234%. We're also starting to send teens uh, weekly inbox notifications that recap their uh, overall amount of screen time. Um, and we think, again, these nudges aren't trying to be overly prescriptive, aren't trying to decide what is developmentally optimal for each user, but rather trying to encourage healthy youth and to encourage more intentionality in how young people engage with the platform. Um, in terms of parenting, we also have a tool called Family Pairing, which folks may be available, uh, uh, may be familiar with. That's sort of TikTok's version of what we call parental controls. Um, and on TikTok, this allows parents and guardians to link their accounts with those of their teens and set up a variety of privacy and safety controls, such as screen time limits, setting a teen's account to private, deciding who can comment on their videos, as well as a, a range of other features. We see this as really enhancing our suite of safety tools and complements our work to provide greater access to product features as users reach key milestones for digital literacy. It's also part of our continued work to, toward providing parents with better ability to guide their teens' online experience while allowing time to educate about online safety and, and digital citizenship. Our design philosophy for family pairing is always centered on balancing parental supervision with teens' privacy and autonomy needs, while recognizing that, again, different teens de uh, develop, develop and mature at different rates. So it's really, you know, putting, putting control um, and empowering teens and parents to set the types of limits that are right for them based on offline conversations, based on their unique needs. Um, but one of the key parts of this design philosophy is that teens have to actively agree to link their accounts to their parents through family pairing and can unlink at any time. Also taking a really privacy first approach to designing family pairing. So things like, you know, private videos stay private. Parents don't get access to direct messaging um, and a range of other sort of privacy considerations. So in terms of looking ahead, we're going to continue investing in sort of these well-being product features. So looking at areas like social comparison and other sort of screen time issues, really ensuring that this is both global and research backed and really developmentally informed to continue, you know, empowering young people and their parents and all users, in fact, with tools to really ensure and sort of create the experiences that it, that is right for them. Um, so I'll leave it there um, and turn it over to Catherine to speak about some of the things that are top of mind for her. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, and it's so exciting to see all of these changes come into effect to support our community. I think it's um, really a testament to the hard work of your team. So happy to see them out in the world. Um, in terms of a theme that I wanted to, to discuss a little bit, um, I think for me, regulation has really been top of mind in, in thinking through some of the ways that we support the research community. Um, I'm thinking particularly about data sharing. Um, so I sit in Dublin, um, which side note, hopefully I am coherent. It's a little bit in the middle of the night here. Um, but I was so excited about this um, event that I couldn't uh, couldn't say no. Um, but so sitting here in Dublin, you know, thinking about the EU regulation that that's coming down the pipeline, um, both the Code of Practice on Disinformation and the Digital Services Act, they have requirements in them that um, include uh, researcher access to platform data. Um, and while this isn't sort of youth safety and well-being specific, um, I, of course, anticipate that this will um, support scholarship in the space. Um, and I think that's something we'd be, you know, eager to see as, as more um, data and more tools become available. Um, so I think overall, you know, when I think about our response um, and the, the, um, the work that we're undertaking kind of to anticipate some of the needs of, of researchers that, that this regulation supports, um, it's been really meaningful to work on since it aligns so well with the goals of my role here at TikTok. 
you know, we are really invested in enhancing opportunities for researchers to investigate online content and activities. Um, and really, you know, we think we will certainly benefit from seeing more perspectives taking on this kind of work. Um, so it's it's an exciting time. Um, as you know, uh, we have committed to deliver a research API globally. Um, currently, it's open for application to US-based academics, but you know we're working to expand that further. Um, yes, exactly. Um, I think I shared the, the link in the chat earlier, but there's some more information there. Um, and that uh, site will, will update as we go and move to kind of the next phases as we go along. Um, so that... Uh, data sharing mechanism will include public data on videos, accounts, and comments. Um, so we see that as one way that, um, you know, we developed it uh, ahead of this regulation, but we do think it's part of our kind of uh, offering to be responsive to, to, to that. Um, but we're also working through, you know, the best mechanisms to share data with uh, vetted researchers um, under the DSA. Um, so we're really, you know, grateful again, and as we think about like partnerships and, and how we, we work through these sometimes like tricky intellectual problems of how you share data and protect privacy and everything. Um, you know, we're, we're in close touch with the European Digital Media Observatory, um, among others. Um, and so it's just um, a really kind of exciting time, I think, to have a really committed, um, innovative team um, here and um, and with our, our colleagues um, on other platforms um, to think through new options and like potential tools that, that TikTok could bring uh, to the table. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think to kind of sum up, um, been spending a lot of time working on the research API and helping make sure that we tested it and that, that we improve as we go. Um, so as we roll that out to more markets, I hope we'll see a lot of interest and see it get, get put to good use, um, particularly to benefit uh, young people online. So that's, you know, uh, what's on my mind in the regulation space and hopefully it's uh, useful to the audience here. Thanks, Catherine and Claire. I enjoy the transparency. Thank you very much about talking to us about how you are aiming to partner with researchers and academics. I can say for certain that's always a big challenge on our end, sometimes even waiting for API access for certain apps to just reach our continent or learning how to vet through the various complex processes so we know we get approval correctly. Um, on that note of being quite open to this conversation about your research access to platform data, as well as Claire's mentioned that your policy is actually all research backed. I wanna be a bit cheeky. We have a room full of academics who are very invested in TikTok. We do qualitative research. You know, every time you have a new feature, we are probably one of the first people to know because we're on it. We need to study the impact straight away. So if you had, a wish list for researchers and the types of research work we would do or the types of knowledge that we could get from our very diverse perspectives. You know, we've got people from six continents um, in attendance today. Tell us a bit about what you would wish out of the genies from us in terms of research projects, progress, concepts, findings. I'll kick us off on that one. And thank you so much for that question. And frankly, for everyone here, for all of the amazing work that you do. As, as we both mentioned um, throughout the conversation, we rely very heavily on external research and experts to really inform the policies that we develop, how we design products to ensure that they are developmentally optimal for young people. So greatly appreciate the work that you do. And um, please know that it is um, very, a key key part of um, the entire trust and safety strategy when it comes to youth safety and well-being. Um, I think in terms of the theme of parenting that we touched on earlier, you know, of course, as I mentioned, family pairing is a tool that we offer globally and one that we're continuing to iterate on to make sure that it's really serving the needs of our community. Um, in that vein, we really see an opportunity for more research into regional and cultural variances in the parent-child relationship and how this manifests 
in navigating online experiences and safety controls. You know, of course, we hear quite a bit about sort of the American style or an American approach to sort of parental supervision, parental controls. Um, and we recognize that this is very different in, in, in different cultures. So in particular, understanding what this looks like in different regions, perhaps where children drive uh, household technology adoption and are often more advanced in digital literacy development um, than older generations. I think that would be really helpful for us and, and our and our product team colleagues as we continue building out these kind of tools that sort of empower parents to set some limits um, over their teens' experience, but also building opportunities and bridges for offline conversations as well. Again, really understanding what that looks like at a regional and cultural level and where those differences may lie. Um, I think another, another theme, and um, I think going just broadly to sort of safety by design considerations, I know mean, this is something that governments around the world that we internally are thinking quite a bit about. You know, I think, Crystal, you had mentioned at the start of the conversation that we often hear folks really focused on sort of the risks and harms posed to young people online, but there are also many great benefits um, for young people when it comes to, you know, accessing technology, building online communities. So more research into sort of best practices for empowering young people to access those benefits through safety by design strategies and overall how we should be striking balances between sort of safety and expression and really honoring, um, ensuring that we honor and, and uh, empower young people to exercise their digital human rights online. Um, so I'll leave it there and, and turn it over to Catherine. I'm sure will has, has a long, a long wish, list list um, in this regard. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And and one of my points is very similar to yours about, um, you know, I think for the, both of us, we sit on the trust and safety team. So we automatically are thinking about, you know, potential harms and risks and things like that. Um, but just really want to, to plus one what you said. Um, there's so many opportunities. Um, you know, I think about the type of educational content that's online and like our kids connecting with it or like are there ways that they could you know benefit more from that um community building um how they um you know participate in the civil space i think there's just like a ton of um of options there that would help us kind of see holistically like their experience on the app um so that that does excite me as well um, I think the other thing that I'll mention, since this is such a great, um, incredible group of researchers here, you know, um, for TikTok, the data sharing space um, and like more substantive research collaboration is still really new. Um, and it's, I mean, in some ways, it's kind of like my baby here at TikTok and I really want it to thrive. Um, and so to do that, you know, I, I really would like the research community um, overall to feel empowered to give us feedback and hopefully be willing to try out different models of collaboration with us. Um, you know, I know that for that to work, we have to kind of take responsibility for earning researchers trust. Um, so to that end, you know, like making sure the tools we provide, such as the research API, um, when you when you're able to access it, that it's, you know, useful and reliable. Um, and show that we can be responsive to research findings, um, you know, as we evolve our approach over time. Um, so those things are really like top of mind for me. Um, you know, I think we are really open to feedback. Um, I'd love, you know, once the, the API rolls out to, to work with the TikTok Cultures Research Network and, and do a demo so that folk kind of know what's available and, and what, what, what you're in for <laughs> with that data access. Um, so that kind of opportunity, I think, would be really exciting. Um, and then, like, the last thing I'll mention is just something that comes up, I think, a lot is, um, for, for us, I mean, is just more, more youth-led research. Um, that to me is like very interesting um, and could be an area where partnering with um, with folks like you all could make a lot of sense um, just in terms of how to best set that up and, and make sure it's successful. So um, I'll leave it there. I know we need to get to Q&A, um, but yeah, just very excited to continue to collaborate and, and get feedback and make sure that what we're able to provide in terms of research partnerships is, is really a win-win for everybody involved. 
Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Claire. You know, on the note of youth-led research, our next session after our Q&A features a group of early career researchers. So you can think about that as youth or young people themselves researching other young people. And we're very excited to hear from guest perspectives coming up next. I'm also really heartened to hear Claire's call for us to do more research into the regional and cultural areas because as social scientists, that's what we do best. Um, and on that note, I think we'll take the last 10 minutes to address some q and A. I'm going to look at them through the Q&A here. I know I've also got some come through by DMs, but I'll prioritize them in order of what I think speaks most to our audience, just so we can keep in time. We've got a question specifically for Claire. Do you have an example of the way that the design of TikTok has changed already due to child safety concerns? Claire. That's a great question. I think I can um, cite one uh, case study in particular. We recently raised the age um, to use uh, to go live um, on TikTok. And that was um, something that we sort of intentionally decided based on feedback from our community and really continuing to raise the bar on safety. We know that this is an industry-wide challenge when it comes to sort of live streamed content. And so to take a really precautionary approach, we have um, raised the age and also really invested in backend safeguards to ensure that when people do go live, that they are of that minimal age, minimum age and that they're only broadcasting content that you know, complies with our community guidelines, but also really taking a broad approach to avoiding any type of exploitation or abuse of young people, whether financial, of course, sexual, or otherwise. Um, so I think that's one recent example of an update where we kind of continue to raise the bar um, on safety from a product design perspective. Okay, that's really good to know. We've got a question more specific about API access. It says here, it's great to hear you've got API access in the works. I understand you have existing partnerships with research groups and centers. Is there an opportunity for individual researchers to get involved in this work? Um, and this attendee tells us the space that they work in and how they would like to discuss the topic further with your research and policy team. Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, as I kind of mentioned, like one thing that we um, that we do a lot are consultations, which are often sort of one on one. Um, I think in terms of the, the space that you're working in, um, body image and eating disorders, that's something that we, you know, are having a lot of conversations about, um, making sure that we're providing a supportive space and, um, you know, making sure that um, it can be uh, managed in, in sort of a more individual way, um, because everyone um, kind of has a different need in terms of what they um what they're comfortable seeing and like what makes sense for them um all that to say you know i i i can see your name in the chat and i can take it down um you know we can we can certainly follow up and, and see if there's a good fit for having some more one-on-one -on -one discussion or potential collaboration yeah and if i can speak from personal experience from having partnered with various country offices across the years i think of the several platforms i've worked with TikTok you still so far appear very amenable to hearing from researchers. So I do appreciate that generosity of spirit. I see that the third question was probably going to be taken by Catherine. For the attendees in the room, the question is, how can TikTok manage fake age accounts that users would choose? In other words, how are we getting past age gating when it doesn't work, Catherine? Yeah, um, so I would say this is one of the issues that comes to mind for me as like a really persistent challenge that the, all the online platforms are dealing with. Um, if if you ask me to to list my um, you know two hour long wish list of of things to work with researchers on, this would actually I think be pretty high up there. Um, you know, coming up with. Um, for, for me and Claire, like you can also chime in. Um, I think for me, what what we're thinking about here is really the the trade off in terms of privacy. So are there ways that we can verify um, users age without being invasive? Um, and so that's something that I think is a challenge that we can certainly um, partner with the research community to answer. Um, 
And also just, you know, if we have to make a trade-off, like what are our users, what are their parents most comfortable with? I think those are huge questions um, that having, you know, an evidence-based approach to is, is really important. Um, but yeah, Claire, feel free to chime in because I know you're thinking about this a lot as well. Yeah, I, I would have to say that of all of the challenges that we face when it comes to youth safety and well-being and child safety online, um, it is sort of age assurances writ large. And this is truly, and I think perhaps uniquely, an industry-wide challenge as well. Um, so I think, of course, requiring um, lots of research and collaboration, um, not, in, not only into the privacy considerations, but also equity and access considerations. So, of course, many of the marketplace solutions today require you know, government documents or like credit cards or things like that. And, and we also know that not everyone has access to those kind of documents. So I think coming up with really research-backed, expert-informed, and industry-wide solutions is really going to be key to such a foundational challenge. Mm. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Claire. We've got a long one, so allow me to truncate this. It's specific to the fact that you do have different country markets and different country offices. This attendee would like you to tell us a bit more about how TikTok develops guidelines and safety tools that are at once universal, but also specific to each region. And they were wondering if you could tell us how ByteDance prioritizes these two tensions as you're developing guidelines and policies. Yeah, so I could jump in with that one from the um, sort of policy development standpoint, and then turn it to Catherine to speak to the research standpoint. So I, my team is within sort of the issue policy team on the product policy department, and we set sort of the baseline guidelines and standards um, that apply across the different sort of verticals of risks when it comes to content policies. But we also have entire teams. We have a regional policy team whose job is focused on um, really ensuring that we take those sort of red lines that are set, set at a global standard and then localizing those to be sensitive to cultural norms, cult, uh, comfort levels, things like that. I think, you know, as an example, um, child exploita sexual exploitation and abuse. That's something that we take a pretty strict global approach to, but then things like what is culturally appropriate minimal clothing, that's an area where we do have more opportunity for localization depending on um, cultural nuances. So um, I think, again, we have teams dedicated to this and it's something that I think is uniquely um, baked in from the start when it comes to how TikTok and ByteDance um, develop their um, content policies. And, and Catherine, I'd love to hear from the research perspective as well. Yeah, well, I think, you know, right now um, we're thinking about this in terms of sort of how we prioritize what research partnerships to take on. Um, and I say that, you know, we're very cognizant that a lot of the research that is available to us um, focuses on, you know, the U.S., Western world, and a lot of, um, I mean, especially if you think of where we have a lot of uh, younger users, um, that's often a mismatch. And so I think, you know, as we look to um, build out our own research agenda and um, work with, with partners, um, you know, it's really important to us that we're actually closing gaps and not kind of redoing work that's already been done. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, when we talk about the reasons for us to, to to work with external partners on research. Um, one really good indicator uh, that it's helpful for us is that the, the research partner would bring a new perspective. Um, so, you know, when we think about like how to um, add the most value for research, like that's, that's a really important thing for us. Um, whether it's, you know, um, actually a different, a different region or like a, a different culture or, um, you know, uh, just a, um, a, a new um, like methodological approach, like things like that, I think are, are really important to have a well-rounded um, research program here. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Claire. Um, we actually do have another string of questions coming in via DM. So we'll archive that and maybe hand that over to you. Researchers are very excited people. In the last one minute, I'm gonna use my prerogative as the moderator and ask if you can tell us in one sentence what a day in the life of your job looks like. And I ask this specifically because we do have a lot of junior researchers in our network. Not many of them would 
go on to stay in research. In fact, many of them go on to work in industry and maybe it'll be good to get a bit of a teaser on what it's like to do your very difficult jobs. Oh gosh, one sentence. Um, well, this is uh, quite a challenge, but I'll, I'll say working with fabulous and incredibly mission-driven um, and multidisciplinary partners from around the world. Lots of meetings, uh, but lots of really important and impactful work that uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to partner with um, on, on these efforts. Catherine. Yeah, I would I would plus one that I think um, in the trust and safety space, you do have just a great camaraderie with people because they are really here for the right reasons. Um, on top of that, I would just say every day is different. Um, some are wonderful, some not so much. There's a lot of <laughs> um, tough things that we have to, you know, figure out. Um, but I think at TikTok, um, because so many things are new and you get a chance to build things, it's it's mostly a, a very exciting time. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate that. Well, everyone, this has been our fireside chat with TikTok. I want to really thank Claire Gutland, the Youth Safety and Wellbeing Global Product Policy Lead for joining us, as well as Catherine Gland, who is Outreach and Partnerships Manager. I also do want to say a very special thank you to jo um, Joanna Hook, who is the ANZ Outreach and Partnerships Manager, whom I've been working with throughout the year and who has really facilitated this whole process. As we know, ByteDance is a very big company, and we do rely on people with a bird's eye view on how to connect next each of us. So thank you all three of you for your work. We're going to take a very short five minute recess and then upcoming next is our round table with our special team of early career researchers leading research in this space. Thank you Claire, thank you Catherine, and I hope we stay around for the next five minute break and join the rest. See you both. Thank you so much. Thank you.